the next unit that we're going to be looking at is called thermochemistry and we are going to start by looking at energy transfers and what energy is. Energy is the capacity for doing work or supplying heat. So for example, lightning strikes would be a type of energy. Um, energy does not have a mass to it and it does not have a volume to it. And thermochemistry specifically is the study of energy changes uh, relating to chemical reactions. We've already looked at chemical reactions like synthesis and decomposition and single and double replacement and even combustion. So thermochemistry is the study of those energy changes when those chemical reactions happen. There's two types of energy when we're looking at a chemical reaction. One of them would be potential energy. And potential energy is the energy stored in the chemical bonds of our compounds. So in a chemical reaction, we know that the chemical bonds break and they get re-bonded with other atoms to form different chemicals. And so any type of chemical bond has the potential to have energy. And we also, a lot of the times in thermochemistry, we're dealing with heat. So heat is specifically an energy that transfers from one object to another because of a temperature difference. So in order for there to be heat, you have to have one object colder, one warmer, or one room colder than another, and then you have energy transfer there, and we call that heat. We represent that in chemistry in when we're calculating it in chemical equations. It's not the unit for heat, just what we use to represent it in a chemical equation is the letter Q. So I don't believe that that prints very well when you type it. So it is a Q. And it always flows from warmer to cooler. So warmer to cooler is the way heat energy flows. And the other type of energy is kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is motion. Whenever anything is moving, it has kinetic energy. So when you have heat flowing from a warmer to a cooler object, there's kinetic energy that's happening there. And the particles in a substance are going to move faster as the temperature increases. So their kinetic energy goes up, and then there's more heat associated with that. When we look at the law of conservation of energy, this is going to be similar to the law of conservation of mass, which we have already talked about. Only this one deals with energy, so it says energy cannot be created or destroyed. And if you've ever played pool and like hit the cue ball to, you know, try and get one of those stripes or colors to go into a pocket, you know that the cue ball is uh, getting energy from the cue stick being hit. And then when the cue ball hits a ball, the cue stick, the sorry, the cue ball will stop or slow down, and the other ball picks up speed. So you haven't lost any energy in that case, but you've transferred it from one to the other. So we're not creating it, we're not destroying it, but it can be transferred from object to object. Now eventually the balls do stop, and so it might look like um, energy's just all gone, it's been destroyed, it's no longer there. Um, but actually it's just been transferred to the felt. There's friction there as the balls are rolling around. So uh, there is an energy transfer then even to the surroundings because you can feel heat coming off of that um, if you were to measure it. And so there's heat going into the surrounding air around it as well. So the energy in your system doesn't decrease, but it can be transferred to the surroundings that it is. So if something loses energy, then something has to be gaining that energy. Now, whenever anything absorbs energy or energy is going into a chemical, then we would call that endothermic. So for example, water, when it's frozen as ice, in order for it to melt, it has to absorb energy. It has to heat up. So endothermic would be an example of that. And then fire, for example, gives off a lot of energy. And we would say that that is exothermic. So anytime energy is released, it's exothermic, it's exiting. Anytime you have something absorbing or heat is going into, then it's endothermic. 
Now, for measuring heat, the unit that we would put behind a number associated with heat is going to be calories or joules. Those are the two units that we would be using. We've probably heard of calories before, but a calorie is the amount of heat that you need to raise a gram of water one degree Celsius. And we've got calories on all sorts of food labels. They actually test that by taking the food and burning the food and as the food is burning they're measuring how much heat is given off of the food uh, by that heat being transferred to water so they can see when you know a certain amount of water has increased a degree you know how much heat have they applied so that they can figure out the amount of calories that are in your food the joule is the SI unit for energy so that's the one that we use probably most in science just because we try to stick with the metric system and using those metric units. If you ever need to convert between a calorie and a joule, this would be a conversion factor that you can use. One calorie is equal to 4.18 joules, uh, sorry, 4.184 joules, and a capital letter J would be the unit you would use for joules, and calorie you can either write it all out or you can abbreviate it with CAL. Uh, when we talk about objects and their heat capacity, that's how much heat that you need to add to it to increase its temperature one degree Celsius. And the heat capacity is going to depend on the mass and it's going to depend on the chemical composition. So if you have a lake and it's really deep and you have a lot of water there, uh, you're going to have to add an awful lot of heat to get that whole body of water to increase. But let's say on the side of the road there's a puddle from a nice spring storm, then that amount of water is obviously going to take less heat to raise its temperature one degree Celsius. They're the same material. It's both, both of them have water. Uh, so heat capacity we don't use as often. Um, we will talk about specific heat. Specific heat takes the amount out and we stick with one gram. So water has the same specific heat whether it's a large amount of water or a small amount of water because you're dealing with how much heat it takes to raise the temperature of a gram of whatever the substance is, one degree Celsius. Specific heat is a characteristic of whatever object you're talking about and so it is something that you can find tables of and um, use in an equation in order to solve some problems. Water for instance is about 4.19, iron about 0.46. Whenever you see the larger number, that's just telling you that more heat is needed to raise water's temperature than it does to, to raise iron's temperature. And if you think about using metal spoons or you know putting something metal on the stove, metal heats up pretty quickly and you can burn yourself. Whereas water, you know, if you've ever tried to boil water, um, it, it takes a few minutes for it to heat up enough to really start boiling. So water takes more heat iron takes less heat, there's why water has the bigger number. Uh, now this equation here is going to be the equation that we can use to calculate the specific heat, and that's what the capital letter C stands for, is for specific heat. We know Q already is what we use to represent heat, which equation-wise, or sorry, unit-wise, joules or calories. M represents mass, and we'll use grams for the mass. And then this delta T, this triangle is called a delta. And that just means change in temperature in this case. And the change in temperature, the equation would be taking your final temperature and subtract the initial temperature. So final minus initial to get your change in temperature. So let's practice. Uh, we're going to do two of these together and then one of them you're going to be doing on your own. So if we're reading through the equation, um, we're trying to find all of our objects to go into a specific heat equation. We have specific heat, we have heat, which is Q, M for mass, and then we have our change in temperature. Uh, we have 95.4 grams, so we know that's going to be our mass. And then it says that the temperature increases from 25, so initially it was at 25, and 48 is our final. So if we're doing final minus initial, we have 48 minus 25. And so we're looking at 23.0 degrees Celsius for our change in temperature. And it tells us in the problem that it absorbs 849 joules of heat 
so we know Q. C is our X, we do not know that. So our equation says specific heat is equal to Q, which is our heat amount, 849 joules. 95.4 is our grams, and multiply that by the 23.0 degrees Celsius. Now in your calculator, you want to make sure that you are dividing by both of these numbers. So 849, divide that by 95.4, divide it by 23.0. Significant digit wise, each one of those numbers has 3, and so 0.387 should be what you get when you do any rounding. And then unit wise, nothing cancels. Joules, grams, degrees Celsius, they're all different, so we keep them all and your unit would look like that. If we do one more, this one's very similar. We are given a Q value. It tells us we have 435 joules of heat. It also tells us that our mass of olive oil is 3.4 grams. And it tells us that it started at 21 degrees Celsius and it increased to 85. So our change in temperature is 85, which is our final minus our initial of 21, so you're looking at your temperature difference of 64 degrees Celsius. And in case, or sorry, and in this case we are also looking for specific heat, just like we did in problem number one. So specific heat, we take our joules, 435 joules, our mass of 3.4 grams goes on the bottom, and we multiply that by our change in temperature, which we calculated at 64 degrees Celsius. So 435 divided by 3.4 divided by 64. Now, we don't have the same significant digits. 435 has 3, 3.4 has 2, 64 has 2. So your final answer is only allowed to have two significant digits, so 2.0. And unit-wise, you have joules, grams, and degrees Celsius. Again, nothing can cancel. And that would be your final answer, your specific heat of olive oil. For practice problem number three, you're going to be doing this one on your own. Notice that they give you the specific heat value. And they're asking you for how much heat is required. So in this case, Q is your unknown. Okay, That's what your X is going to be. And we've done many problems where you can cross multiply, so I know that you are able to do this one. But I do want you to try this one on your own. Make sure you look at significant digits. And since you're looking for Q, your choices would be, uh, for unit-wise, would be joules or calories. But if you take a look at your specific heat, you should be able to figure out which of those two units you should use in this particular case.